in this slide deck, I'm going to introduce you to some of the concepts of systems analysis and design, as well as the systems development life cycle and the formal processes that we use to develop systems. So let's go ahead and get started. So our learning objectives are to define exactly what information systems analysis and design is and the development life cycle. Describe the information systems development life cycle in detail. So I'll tell you about the different steps and some of the things that we do at those steps. We'll talk a little bit about case tools, which are computer-aided software engineering tools, and also some other methodologies. Uh, so the primary methodology we'll talk about is SDLC, but I'm going to talk about some other methodologies like agile and extreme programming. Then I'm going to talk about the object-oriented analysis and design, uh, as well as the rational unified process. And in this course, I am going to cover object-oriented analysis and design and the object-oriented development lifecycle in a little bit more detail than the textbook. So starting with the uh, information systems analysis and design. So basically, um, when we think about analysis and design, yeah, I think a lot of folks have probably taken at least a, you know, a, beginning, a beginner programming class. Uh, and if you haven't, maybe you've taken something similar where you might be given a small task to complete in a course as part of the coursework. And you probably didn't have to do a lot of design work you know, to approach that, that problem. In other words, maybe let's say your instructor gave you an example to solve a problem using a computer program that calculates pi or calculates prime numbers, maybe the first 100 prime numbers. And you can think of some of the steps that you might take to do that, and it's pretty straightforward to create a small program that would do that. So for relatively small tasks and for relatively small applications, we don't really have to use a formal design technique. Now, taking this, uh, looking at this from a different perspective, um, let's say you're doing a small project around your house or doing a small project outside of school or something along those lines. So for example, let's say you're trying to build a small shed in your backyard. If you're trying to build a small shed in your backyard, you can probably do it without too much analysis or too much planning and too much design. So you may know that you want a shed that, say, I don't know, a few meters wide by a few meters, uh, a few meters long, and you know what type of roof you want and so forth. You can go down to the store and buy the lumber and start constructing this small shed in your backyard, and you probably will be able to build a pretty decent shed because it's just four walls, a door, and that's pretty much it, maybe a floor. Now, let's pretend you want to build a house. If you're trying to build a house or a building, an actual structure with many rooms, plumbing, electrical, and all of the other things that come along with a real building project, if you try to do that project without adequate analysis and design, your project is very likely to fail. So as projects get more complex, we need to have some sort of formal process to help us design and analyze what we need and then design our solution and then implement that solution. And IT systems are no different. Unfortunately, it's far too easy with IT systems for us to begin the development process or the building process of our systems without thinking about design. Frequently how this happens is when you have a small business that implements some information system without adequate design because at the time it's a very small system but as the business grows that system might start to outgrow uh, the uh, the business and they'll have to build onto it and they'll just keep tacking things onto it just bolting on functionality or different pieces until all of a sudden they have a solution that was never really designed and it doesn't work the way that it should or it's not as efficient as it should so we can certainly benefit at all levels of doing an adequate, going through this process of adequately ana analyzing and designing a system. And that's what we're going to learn about in this course is the proper procedure and the methodologies and the tools to build a system, to, to, to analyze, design, and build a system. And what those proper procedures look like and how we can ensure that we're following those processes. So application software is computer software designed to support organizational functions and processes. So uh, in this course, we talk mostly about how to analyze and design application software, which uh, which basically becomes op operational software within an organization or a business. A systems analyst is the person whose role is responsible for the analysis and design of information systems. So this is the person that actually goes through this process. When I talked about building a shed in your backyard versus building a home or a building or a real structure, anybody can pretty much build a shed in their backyard. It's not very difficult. It's one of the easiest projects you can do, uh, you know, building projects, that is. 
But not anybody can build a house. And it's not just building a house. If you think about building a house, there's more than just the person that builds the house. You also have all of the different specialties like plumbing, electrical, and so forth. You also have architects that design the house. Well, in this course, what we're learning how to do is be the architect and the project manager. That's what we're talking about in this course, is the architect, the person that's designing the system. Just like you would have an architect that designs a house. Now, could an architect build a house? Maybe some architects can. But is it a requirement to be an architect? Absolutely not. Just like in this course, I'm going to teach you some of the systems analysis techniques and tools and methodologies that we'll use to build systems and design systems. But you don't necessarily have to know how to actually implement and, and build, you know, how to code these systems. Just like an architect, they know how to, how to design a house. They know how to put the blueprints together, and they're very good at that. But if you took an architect and gave them blueprints and said, go build this house, would they be able to pick up a hammer and start putting together framing and, and digging a foundation and uh, running electrical and plumbing and all the other things? Probably not. There are people that are better suited for those tasks just like in IT systems development. So one of the common misnomers is that people who design information systems have to be programmers, which they don't. So I like to kind of discuss that in the beginning of this course, that it's not a requirement to be a programmer to be a good systems analyst. So I keep mentioning this. There are three things that we're going to talk about in this course. We're going to go over methodologies of systems analysis and design. I'm going to talk about a few of those methodologies here in this slide deck. So one of those is going to be the systems development lifecycle. Uh, the other one is going to be, uh, we'll talk about Agile and extreme programming. Um, and then we're going to talk about tools that we can use. So we have tools that are available to us in order to do this analysis and design. And then we'll talk about techniques. So for example, with techniques, I'm going to talk about different diagramming and modeling techniques that we can use that demonstrate the analysis and design of a system. And I'll show you the process for developing those models that can be used by developers and can be used by users to ensure that we're designing a system that they need. So we'll talk about that. So the IS project, so most IS projects back in the old days, if you go all the way back to the 1950s, uh, they focused on efficient automation of existing processes. And then by the 1960s, we had the advent of procedural third generation languages, which were faster and more reliable. And then by the 1970s, systems development became more like an engineering discipline, just like they do design uh, of other objects in engineering. So if you think about building a car, for example, to build a car or to design a car to manufacture a car, there's a tremendous amount of engineering that goes into that. You have to analyze to see what the needs are going to be in the market in three or three to four years by the time this car hits the market. For example, if you build an SUV and no one wants SUVs in four years, then you've wasted your time. So you're going to do a tremendous amount of market analysis. Uh, you're going to see what technologies are going to be available to you uh, in, in, the, in the coming years as you build the car. You're going to look at what your competitors are doing to see what types of features are interesting to consumers and so forth. And then you start designing this vehicle. You're going to make models so that uh, everyone can understand exactly what it is that you're designing. You're going to make sure that consumers are going to want this vehicle. Uh, and you're going to keep designing until you're ready to actually tool a plant. So tooling a plant, meaning that you're building the specialized equipment to manufacture that car. Um, so, you know, typically automobile manufacturers can't just manufacture any car in any plant. They have to tool the plant for the specific vehicle that they're making. Uh, you know, there's some specific things that you have to do. It's a very costly, a very expensive and time consuming process. And then eventually that car is going to start getting manufactured. They're going to roll off the assembly line. Uh, and that is the traditional method of engineering a, uh, a large project. So in the 1970s, IT projects weren't all that different from that technique. They basically, people who had an engineering background got into this field, uh, you know, software engineers, for example, and electrical engineers who had that classical training in how we do design in, in other areas. But it doesn't, it's not very well suited to systems development. For example, if you're manufacturing a car, and let's say the car has a problem, maybe the gas tank is in the wrong location and it's causing issues, or maybe you didn't make the axle strong enough or something like that, or some kind of dangerous condition with that vehicle, what most manufacturers will have to do is a recall. So after they start manufacturing the car, they discover a problem or a flaw, they do a recall, they have to have people bring the cars back, and they have to do the repair at their cost. 
That's a very costly process. It's very expensive to do that. So we want to try to avoid that in something like manufacturing a car. Now think about information systems. How difficult is it to make changes to an information system? Do we have to retool a plant? Do we have to go back and design from scratch? Is it very costly to do that? In most cases, the answer is no. So it's a much different environment. So going forward to the 1980s, we started seeing these new tools and these new techniques and methods of software development. Object-oriented software started becoming more popular. It created a different mindset or required a different mindset for systems design. It was very different from the procedural programs that we had uh, back in the 1970s. And even fast forwarding into the 1990s, um, in the 1990s, they started focusing on system integration, GUI applications and client server platforms, the internet, until we get to today where most of this is, uh, it, you know, if you think about it, most newer applications, especially in business, most of them are designed to work with web application technology. So they're, they're, they're built to work with web technologies like apps on your phone uh, and so forth. So things have changed considerably. We're not developing client server applications as much anymore. Of course, these things still happen, but a lot of this has changed the way we do systems development. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about throughout this course. We're going to talk about um, this, this process and how it's an iterative process. In fact, let me go ahead and start talking about that. So the system development methodology is a standard process followed in an organization to conduct all the steps necessary to analyze, design, implement, and maintain information system. So the phases of the SDLC start with planning. So when we do the software development life cycle, when we follow this, this cycle, we always start with planning, then we do some analysis, then we do design, implementation, and finally maintenance. So it looks something like this, where we start with planning up at the top, then we go into our analysis phase, then our design, implementation, and maintenance. And just to give you a brief overview of what in, what's entailed in each one of these phases, when we do planning, we're trying to determine what projects are necessary. Do we have the, uh, the means to complete this project? Is the project going to, you know, do we, have the, do we have the money to complete the project, the manpower? Uh, we're making sure that we're setting ourselves up for success on this project in the beginning. If you take a project management course or you have a PMP, for example, which is project management certification, uh, you probably learned a lot about planning. And we'll talk in this course about planning quite a bit. Uh, we're going to spend a unit or two looking at project management and project selection because it's a very important part of the systems development life cycle. Because if we don't choose the right project, if we choose a project that's destined to fail, then you know we've made a big mistake right from the beginning. So it's good to make sure that we're setting ourselves up for a successful project and that we're going to ensure that success by making sure we're following the discipline of project management. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we go into the anal analysis process, and the analysis process is all about understanding. So our planning is making sure that we have the resources. Analysis is when we start trying to understand what it is we're going to do. If I told you that you needed to develop a system to run a pizza shop, uh, you know, that's a pretty basic explanation. And you might start getting ideas on what exactly you would do to run a pizza shop and what types of functionality they would need. But you would be guessing as to that functionality, unless you happen to work at a pizza shop right now, or you own a pizza shop. Many of you probably don't have a very strong understanding of exactly what it's re what's required to run a pizza shop, even though it's a relatively simple concept. We've all ordered pizza. We've all been to, to restaurants that sell food similar to a pizza shop. Um, so it's good to understand what the needs are of the user. And that's what the analysis phase is. So in the, the second part of the course, so the first part we talk about planning, and the second part we're going to talk about analysis, which is all the things that we can do to understand what the needs are. And if we don't adequately understand what the needs of the business or the organization are, then the project is once again doomed to fail. So we have to understand what those needs are in a formal process. A formal analysis is going to help us do that. So I'm going to show you some of the techniques that we're going to use to do a thorough analysis. And that's where we begin looking at our modeling techniques. Once the analysis phase is complete, we move into the design phase where we actually design the system based on what we found in our analysis. Then we implement. Implementation is basically writing the software, uh, purchasing the, the systems, you know, it could be a variety of things. We'll talk in the other slide deck, uh, in a future slide deck, I'll talk about the sources of software. Uh, and that's when the implementation happens, when we source that software or develop that software. And then finally, once it's implemented, then we have to maintain it over time. We have to support it, document it, and so forth. Now, you'll notice that we have an arrow going back to planning. So when we get finished with this process, it looks like we go back to planning. And in fact, we do. 
Because the thing about systems analysis and design, or the SDLC, the Systems Development Lifecycle, is that it is iterative in nature, or evolutionary. And so taking a look at this other diagram here on the right-hand side, once we start the project, you can see we go around this cycle over and over again through many iterations. Uh, and through each iteration, we've learned a little bit more, we've done a little bit more work, we've made the system a little bit better, and we keep doing that until we get to the end of our project. So we might start with a simple prototype in that first iteration, and then we make a slightly more, uh, more functional prototype, and we keep going around until we have a fully functional released version of the software. So, uh, so again, it's an iterative process, and this is something that's difficult to do when you're building a car. You can't start manufacturing the car and see how well it drives and see how well it works because you've had to spend a tremendous amount of effort, time, and money to tool that factory, to design that vehicle, to get it through regula regula regulatory you know, uh, process and so forth. But with IT systems, with information systems, we can use this iterative process and we can continually improve until we have a system that we release. You can see in this example, this system has been iterated through seven times, which is pretty typical. You might go through anywhere from six to ten iterations before you have a release on a moderately complicated system. So again, it's an evolutionary model. We're going over and through that process over and over again. So again, in the planning phase, uh, we're going to uh, uh, we're going to make sure that we know what needs are. Uh, we're going to prioritize what our possible projects are. Make sure that this is a project that makes sense doing, and that we have the resources to do it. Then, in the analysis phase, we are going to look at the system requirements. Uh, they're going to be studied and structured. So we're going to make sure we understand. So analysis is synonymous with understanding. Understanding exactly what the needs are and what the system needs to do. Then we're going to go through the design phase, which is the description of the recommended solution, and it's converted into logical and then physical system specifications. So we're taking that analysis that we've done, and we're turning that into a design that can be used by a developer or by an IS uh, professional who's going to either acquire the software, outsource, or build, and we'll talk about some of those options later on. Uh, we also have logical design, which is all the functions and features of the system chosen for development in the analysis described independently of any computer platform. So the logical design is basically where we're designing the system independent of the technology. And we'll talk about that when we get to design. We'll talk about the perfect technology assumption, which is where we, we ignore the technology when we're doing a logical design. And then we later come back to that in the physical design. We come back to our limitations of the hardware. So we say in a perfect world, what would this system be able to do then we try to backfill technology to make it do that, to try to, to try to fill that. And a lot of organizations take the wrong approach here where they say, you know, let's, let's see what technology exists. Let's see what solutions exist. And let's build our business process around the technologies that already exist. And you certainly could do it that way. And I think there might be, a, you know, moderate success doing it that way. But in most cases, we want to support the business process. We don't want the business process to be supporting the information system. So we want to make sure that we're looking at the logical design, you know, what, what's the ideal solution, and then how can we meet that need? And a lot of times, by doing that logical design first, we push ourselves to meet that, that design decision uh, in the physical design where we ordinarily wouldn't have done that. So we kind of find ways to make that work. Uh, we push ourselves to find new technologies that are going to work, and we push the, the boundary and push the envelope of what's possible uh, by doing that logical design first. Uh, and then we have implementation, which is when the system is coded, tested, installed, and supported by the organization. And then finally, in the maintenance phase, the, uh, the information system is systematically repaired and improved over time. So here's an example from uh, a textbook that shows you some of the tasks uh, that you would be completing in each one of these phases. And we're going to be talking about these different tasks throughout the course. So for example, in planning, we'll talk about the project management tasks that you might have to take. We'll talk about doing work breakdown structures, and uh, we'll talk about uh, doing PERT analysis and making sure that we understand how, how the time is being uh, estimated and so forth in a structured way. We'll talk about the analysis uh, outputs, which are some of the models and diagrams that we're going to talk about. And again, we'll talk about those models and diagrams again in the design. And we'll talk about uh, testing plans with implementation, testing plans how to manage uh, you know, the development of the software or the acquisition of software, things like uh, requests for proposals and so forth. And then finally, maintenance, which is when the new versions are released. And we'll talk about how to, you know, some, some topics with training and support and documentation.